we're talking about is the common emitter, the common collector, or more commonly, uh, the more and more fashionable name nowadays for it is called the emitter follower. So, either way, they're the same thing. So now the idea here is that the common terminal here, instead of being the emitter, is the collector. And one way to do that is the following. So for instance, you can have the collector connected to some fixed potential. Let's say, in this case, it is an NTN the way I've shown it. It has to be connected to a high voltage, so the VCC. This is your VN, the base, and the output is taken out of the emitter, the out. So in a common collector of, uh, topology, the input is the base and the output is the collector. I would say the emitter. And there's some sort of resistance RE in the emitter in general. Now, what, is this, what does this stage do? Let's look at it. What do you expect it to do? What do you expect a relationship between the in and the out to be? Well, I can write an expression for it. But before I do that, let, let me, I, I want to ask you something. What do you expect it to do? Let me to make it even simpler for you. Let's say, instead of RE for now, just for a second, I have a constant current, let's say I wise. An ideal current source keeping this current at the constant level. In other words, the emitter current is fixed, therefore the collector current is fixed. So what can you say in that case about the relationship between V in and V out? Just looking at it.
growing, but it's only a logarithmic dependent. But you can see for the most part, this guy follows that in some sort of drop. The slope is very slightly smaller because, of course, this, these start deviating because of this natural log dependence. In the previous case, on a constant current source, though, it looks exactly like this. It's a constant. For the constant current source. But you still see the general behavior that the output follows the input. And in the first case, the slope would be exactly 1, the way it's shown. So now let's see if our small signal model concurs with this, if the results we obtain from the small signal model agrees with this. So let's look at it. From the small signal perspective, what, which model do we want to use? Do you think I should? I mean, you can use either one. And the book again uses the final by the T model. It's a lot easier than this way. It's a lot more insane. Incredibly easy. Okay. So this is my T model. Alpha IE. This is IE. This is VN. This is V out. What is the gain in this case? Just the way I show it. It's a voltage source here. It's VN. Right? It's a voltage divider. Right? That's inconsequential because that's a current source in parallel with a voltage source. It's a voltage source. Alpha Rm, this would be out. 
and this is R E. Now, if I move a resistor, if, move, if I take the resistor and put it here, what resistor do I need to get to use to get the same E and prime here? If this current were I E now instead of I D. What is the value of the resistor I can place here? So V and prime will be the same as before. RB over the plus one. Exactly. So it's RB over one plus theta. Right? So if I do that, this voltage will change. Agree? And hence the rest of the expressions will not, I mean the rest of the behavior on the circuit will not change. So I place something here that keeps this voltage and hence everything else the same. So from that perspective, these two are equivalent. And that's another example of the reflection rule I talked about a few minutes ago. So I've taken a resistor from the base and moved it to the emitter, divided it by one plus theta. The same way that I can take the resistance out of the emitter and move them to the base in a small signal model. And multiply them by one plus theta. It's a useful thing if you want to calculate things quickly. So even if I have that resistor, now if I ask you what is my gain? What would you tell them? My voltage gain. With a social resistance. Like well, again, it's a voltage divider, right? Except for the fact that now I have three resistors, so I have to add a third term here. So this is RB41 plus beta. So that's my gain. It lowers my gain a little bit more, because there will be a voltage drop across the base resistor too. But that base resistor is not very significant, unless it's huge, right? Because it gets divided by beta. So its effect is reduced. So that's good, because this is a potentially small term. Right? So is this one. This is Rn. This is 1 over Gn, the small quantities that we saw before. 1 milliamps was 25 ohms. And let's say your Re is 1 kilo ohm. And your beta is 100. So this is about 10 ohms. This is 25 ohms. And if you have an Re of 1 kilo ohm, this is 35 ohms compared to 1 kilo ohm. So it's 1 divided by 1.035. So it's close to 1. Right? But still, again, it's lower than 1. So Well, let's look at some other properties. The other properties that we can usually look at when we look at the things, in addition to gain, the input and output impedance, or the input and output impedances. So let's look at the input impedance. If I were to calculate R in, but let's do this, R in. What is it? Think about the reflection rule. Why don't we use the reflection rule and try to determine R in quickly here without having to write equations? And this is one thing I want you to start learning. So pay attention to how we do it and try to practice it. So eventually I want you to be able to look at the stages and gradually using these rules in your head and say, well, yeah, of course, that's the input impedance. So if I move this from the emitter to the base, I multiply for 1 plus beta and blah, blah, blah. So this is the input impedance, or this is the output, or that's the game for simple stages. Because these are the Lego, the basic elements of the Lego game we'll play later on. So, so it's important for us to spend enough time on these so you understand these basic building blocks very well, so when we put them together and make bigger things out of them, you don't have to write every equation for every electron every time. You don't do that either, but just... The same way that we, you know when we went from device physics to this model, right? We abstracted them away. You don't think about electrons anymore. You don't think about Fermi levels or energy band diagrams anymore. Right? Well, we can't. We could, but it would be... I mean, we'll come back to them when we have to, but the thing is that we need to Go be able to abstract it away. So I want you to gradually start learning to abstract away even from this and start learning other things. So having said that, let's look at this and try to do that. You remember reflection rules. What did reflection rule tell me? If I wanted to take everything out of my emitter and put them in the base, what, what do I need to do? Exactly. So, well, this is already in the base. So what else do I need to take out of the base? It's this guy, multiply one, one plus beta. What is one plus beta times alpha or it's beta Rm, which is what? Beta Rm is what? R pi. R pi. Beta over Gm, right? R pi. So that gives me an R pi. And what does this one give me? 1 plus beta Re. Just multiply. It's very similar to that, in fact. Remember? It should be, because from the input perspective, it's exactly the same as a common emitter with the generation. So it's all of that plus Rb. So my Rn is Rb plus Rπ, which was just beta, 1 plus beta times that, plus 
plus 1 plus beta Re. So it's quite large, right? Because if you want to have 1 kilo ohm of Re, that's something like 100 kilo ohms. And you know, R plus is 1 milliamp, and a beta of 100 is about 2.5 kilo ohms. So this is dominating the dominating terms. It's beta Re, the first order. It's large. It's beta Re. So if I have 1 kilo ohm here, it's about 100 kilo ohm, roughly speaking. So it has a very large input impedance. All right, that's good. How about the output impedance? Let's calculate the output impedance. Now, to calculate the output impedance, what do I need to do? I need to know all the independent sources. And you have to be careful. Although you may not see a source, there is an independent source here that needs to be known. Where is it? Yeah, yeah exactly. I know this. And if I know that, what do I see? Well, I see some circuits here. But these two are equivalent, right? I argue, so I could do it here and make my life easier. If I do that, then I don't have to worry about this current source. Because this current source is shorted across, so all of the current will go through that short. So, not, so basically, all I have to worry about is this combination. What is the impedance looking here? The parallel resistance. The parallel combination of this guy and the series combination of those, right? So R out. Simply Re in parallel with alpha Rm plus Rb over 1 plus beta. Okay, is it small or large? Let's say 1 milliamp, 1 kilo ohm, whole part, just let's pick some numbers to see how it looks like. So this is 1 kilo ohm, alright? 1 kilo ohm in parallel with this guy. So let's see what this guy is. Let's say my Rb is also 1 kilo. So Rm with 1 milliamp is what? At 1 milliamp, Rm is Vt over Ic, right? 25 millivolts divided by 1 milliamp, 25 volts. Think about that. Now, Rb was 1 kilo ohm, let's say divided by beta, divided by beta of 100 is about 10 ohms. So the 10 ohm plus 10 plus 25 is 35 ohms. In parallel with 1 kilo ohm, it's 35 ohms. Right? Maybe 34 and change, but let's say 35. Okay? It's small. So it has a large, in general, for typical number, it has a large input impedance and small output impedance. So, is it any different from a wire? Yes, of course it is. Uh, for one thing, it generates heat. But, uh, but other than that, from a certain perspective, well, what does it do? It, it has a high input impedance and low output impedance. What is that? What is this stage that has a high input impedance and low output impedance? What is it useful for? Well, you could use it, think about it that way, or in general it's a buffer, right? If you have a voltage amplifier that generates a voltage, but it has a high output impedance, you can use this guy to, to follow it. You can follow it with this guy, because it has a high input impedance, so it won't load your previous stage. Because remember, the gain of the stages is determined by the load resistor, right? If you lower your load, it's reduced, it reduces the gain. So if I have another stage here whose input impedance is comparable or smaller than that, your effective load resistance is the parallel combination of these two. So it could be dominated by that. So you don't want this to be large for the subsequent stage. You want it to be, I'm sorry, you don't want it to be small, you want it to be large. Right? You want it to be as large as possible. If, if, in theory, you want this to be infinite because that will not load this at all. So you will have the same gain. You won't lower your gain. Now, how about the output impedance? Well, the, the output of this guy, or the previous thing, is driving this. If I have a very large source resistance, then will, there will be a voltage divider between this and the input resistance of this guy. Right? So I want the output of, of a voltage amplifier to have as low an impedance as possible. I want it to be as close voltage source as possible. Right? The voltage, an ideal voltage source has a zero input impedance. So this is a good thing. 
pan w lewo. Now, this is my Vn. What should I connect the base to? 
that says constant voltage. So this is nothing but ground. So if that's grounded, this is very simple to analyze, right? Because I can even redraw it slightly differently like that. So well, this is connected to ground, and that's connected to ground. Okay. So what is IE? IE is minus Vn divided by alpha Rm. This voltage divided by that resistor. Right? And what is V out? V out is minus alpha IE times RC. So the minus signs cancel. I, alphas cancel. I get uh, RC over RM and Vn. Therefore, AV, the voltage gain, is GM RC. Exactly the same in absolute terms as the gain of a common emitter. At least at this level, if I go R1. And except for the fact that it's non invariant, so it's positive. And it shouldn't be surprising because, again, our modular thing is voltage, should bond with that current. Okay, so that's the gain. How about the tempo impedance? Looking in, what do I see? What is the equilibrium? Alpha R. It's alpha R. Is it large or small? It's very small, right? It's R M. It's one G M. So, what kind of a stage is it? I mean, for at least from the input perspective. Is it, okay, well, let me ask you this question. Is it good ammeter or is it a good voltmeter? Ammeter, right? Because if, if you want to measure a voltage, you want to have your measurement system has to have a large impedance. That's why voltmeters usually have a high input impedance, right? I mean, that, that's why you want, because if you, if you want to put it in the, you know, measure the line voltage, 110 volts, let's say, or RMS 110, you want to put it in there without drawing a lot of current. Now, on the other hand, an ammeter, which goes in series, has a low input impedance, a low impedance, uh, because all the current has to go through it without a major drop in voltage. Okay. And that's why, unlike the previous stage, it had a high input impedance, this has a low input impedance, so it's not very good for voltage amplification as is in its current form. But it's very good for measuring currents because it has very low input impedance. So if you want to amplify current, for instance, this is the way. And there are other applications. And this kind of this uh, story uh, reminds me of a story of something that happened to me about ammeter and voltmeter, right? Uh, when I was a kid, I was trying to measure the. Uh, I, mean, I had this kind of voltmeter, so they keep nice. So, okay, let me go and measure the. Voltage. So I measured it, and it was okay. Well, so the voltage was okay, right? So I measured it, and in my case, it was 200. So let, let me measure the amp, you know, the, the, the current of this third line, right? <laughs> so I put it on the ammeter, put it in there, you can imagine what happens. Just, <laughs> close the fuse and all that stuff. So, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> That's why you want to put the ammeters in series and voltmeters in pair. Okay, okay. I'm sure you haven't done that. Or, or maybe I haven't. I was dumb enough to do that. Uh, anyway, but I have a story to tell you. Okay, now that's fine. How about the output impedance? Well, the way I've shown it is very simple, right? The output impedance of this state, if, if you ignore RO, is what? Not all the independent sources, if you're in doubt. This is zero. Ground, ground, IE is zero. This current source is zero. Comes open. CRC. So, if I ignore RO. But let, let's not ignore RO. Let's put RO back in and see what is doing. This is 
ground. And this is basically now let's let me just try to make it and, and make it a little more general now that I'm at it. But in this case, I've assumed that my source is an ideal multi-source, right? It doesn't have any source resistance. Its source resistance is zero. But let's say my multi-source is really has some source resistance. So this is V in and this is R S. This, this makes it more general. If I'm not happy with that RF, I can always set it to zero and use my same, same similar expression. So let's put some RS in here. Source resistance. And now if I want to know my independent sources, so this has to be zero, that's weak now. And RO is connected here between this guy and that guy. And I have RC. So let me keep RC separate like before. And I know that my R out really is this. But let's calculate this one first and put RC in parallel with it later, RF prime. Now, what is this output resistance? If I were to calculate it, I could do everything I did over there, but I would also notice that that's exactly the same circuit. And not to do everything and use the result, except for the fact that now RS is RE. It's exactly the same thing. If I null this node and that node, basically I've nulled both the emitter and the base, fine. So I know R out prime, or even R out, is simply RC in parallel with RO. 1 plus GM RE over alpha, 1 plus GM RE over beta. The same expression. Well, except for the fact that instead of RE, I have RS. It's the same network, the same set of circuits, so it has to give you the same result. So I won't have to redo it. Alright, fine. Now, what is the total gain on this stage? If I, if I didn't ignore R O? Well, it's really nothing but GM times the total resistance I see here, not just R C, right? Because that's the equivalent of total resistance in the collector. This R out. So my gain is GM R out in general. Now, if RO is large, very large, infinity, this becomes insignificant, so it becomes GM RC like before, so it reduces to the previous expression. But in general, that's my game. But now, let's look at that. Let's rewrite it as GM RC in parallel with RO, blah, blah, blah. Let's drop the alpha. So, that's my gain. Now, what's the maximum achievable gain of this state? By the way, what was the maximum achievable gain of a common collector or emitter follower? The buffer stage. One, right? It's already been, been, been. So, what's the maximum achievable gain of this one? So, I'm interested in AD max for common base. Well, one, for one thing, I know I have to get the RC. So, if I, let's say, bias into the current source or something like that. RC becomes inconsequential, so that's what's left. So how large can that get? Well, we know what the limit of this thing is, right? We did that calculation. If I even if I make if my, if I make my RS very large, GMRS is very large. Let's say my GMRS is very large. What does this reduce to? Beta. Asymptotic reaches beta, so this becomes beta R. This GM R O and beta. Now GM R O was what? Was was the maximum achievable gain or maximum gain of a common emitter? Now which was V A over V T. So this was V A over V T. But now the difference is that this stage has some very interesting property. Its maximum gain is beta times greater than that of the common event. So it's capable of achieving higher gain per stage than the common event. Although the gain looks on the surface similar at this level, but the limit is greater because of the output resistance. But that can only be achieved if RC, I'm oh, sorry, if RS is large, if I drive it to the high integer source, okay? Now, let's say I want 
want to get that, somehow I want to save up. Yeah, if you look at that, so that's tempting. I can make my aim 100 times greater than this principle than what I could before. How do I do that? Well, it's fine to draw these things with you know, ideal computers and ideal currencies, but at some point I have to have some, make it out of transistors or resistors and real elements. So, can you think of a high impedance source? What? Uh, the, uh, a current source? Well, yeah, I want something that mimics a current source, something that whose output impedance is large to drive the stage with. Right? I have this common base stage. So, I have the bias and some RC, BCC, VL. But now I want to drive this input with something that has a large source impedance, whose output impedance is large. Common emitter? Or I'm sorry? A common emitter? Common emitter, yeah. Common emitter has a very large output impedance, right? If I do, its output impedance is RO. RO is quite large. What if I put a common emitter here? Right? And drive the input here. If I do that, let's look at the impedance levels. Looking into here, what do I see? In a common emitter with no degeneration for now. What is the output impedance? What is the intrinsic output impedance, right? There was the RC part which was extrinsic, extrinsic, but there was something intrinsic. What, what do you see? What is the model? Think about the T model or the pi model. Like that. RO. This is RO. Right? So is RO large enough? Well, what needs to be large? RO is my RS here, right? This is the source resistance here. GMR, RS is the quantity I have to evaluate. And as long as it's much greater than, it's, it's large, or greater than beta, I'm fine. Okay? So, what is GMRO? GMRO is VA, uh, VA over VT. 50 volts divided by 25, that's 2,000, right? It's the intrinsic gain of the common letter. So this quantity is quite large. Even if my beta is 100, that's 20 compared to 1. So I'm really in a good shape as far as this is concerned. I'm talking, this is almost beta with something like that. Okay? So it shouldn't be surprising if I say, well, in this case, the output the resistance looking down into here, ignoring the R RC, just the intrinsic part of it, is what? Look at these numbers. What is it? So, so this condition holds. So what is this resistance here? What is it? Beta R. Beta R? a very good approximation, right? If this was 20, this whole thing was 20, we went to 1. So that's almost beta. So now the, up, the intrinsic output resistance of this stage is beta RO. How about its intrinsic gain, maximum intrinsic gain? Well, let's find out what the gain of this thing looks like. Now, again, I can draw the small signal model for this. And, well, I'll do it at some point. But let's see if we can analyze it without drawing the small signal directly. Indirectly, looking at this in our minds, drawing the small signal. So I have a B in here. Right? This is the small signal of variation. What is this current? The small signal part of it. GMVN, right? Now, this current gets divided between the, imp the impedance looking down and the impedance looking up. This is, the, this is the current source driving this node, right? But that node has two resistors, one hanging this way and the other one looking up. What is that, the one looking up? They have already calculated that. Where is that? Here. The impedance is looking at the emitter. It's very small. It's alpha or f. So where would the current go? Where would most of the current go? Think about typical value. This is 1 milliamp, 25 volts. This is 1 milliamp, the area of 50 volts, 50k. It, almost all of it goes that way. Right? There? Right. So this current goes there. So now, and, and that current, this is the emitter current, and it's related to the collector current through what? How are the emitter and collector currents related? Alpha. So it's, this current is alpha 
GM Nickel. Now, what does it drive? So, it's a current source driving that node, this node. Okay? Now, you have to look at the total impedance on that node. What is the total? There are two things in parallel there. One, the resistance looking down, which is Beinaro. The other one is the resistance, resistance looking up, which is what? RC. So, the voltage in the output is that current times this, well, this current times the total resistance with a minus sign, because that current is being drawn out of that node, being pulled out of it, right? So, it becomes minus alpha gm me in times rc in parallel with beta r o. So, av, the voltage gain, is minus alpha gm rc in parallel with beta r o. Does that make sense? You can draw the small signal and write the same result. Exactly. So that's my voltage gain for the cascode. Now, how large can it be? What is the largest can it be? If RC becomes very large, it's alpha GM beta R O. So beta GM R O. Close to that. A maximum of that value, the common base. So I can achieve much higher gain in principle using the cascode if I have a large enough impedance at the load. By the way, this stage is called the cascode. I just now, you may have heard this name. It's not cascade, it's called cascode. C-O-D-E. You know why it's called cascode? What's the etymology, I guess? Um, it's actually going to go back to vacuum tube days. Now you've done, oh, you're, you're about to go back to vacuum tube, right? You haven't done it, have you done a vacuum tube yet? We did. We did it last time, right? Okay, so in vacuum tube, so you have the diode, which has two terms, cathode and anode, right? And then you have basically the triode, but in triode you have a grid, the third term of the grid. By changing its potential, you'll basically change the amount of opening that you have in the potential space through which the electrons can still pass. So when you apply a negative voltage to it, basically you're changing, you're making this hole. So there are, if you look at equal potential surface, surfaces, these are at higher potential, but there are still holes in the middle that are lower potential. It's a three-dimensional thing. In space, you can think about it. So, right? so you're modulating the width of the holes that have that do not have a high enough negative or low enough potential to bounce the electrons back. So the electrons can go through them. Now, when you apply a larger negative one, you make this hole smaller and larger, right? So that's the triode, has three terminals, right? Now, there is a, there are, so what the problem with that was that the modulation here will affect things there. So if it had a very low output impedance, effectively. So the collective current will also depend on this point as well. Uh, so it depends on the voltage, I'm sorry, so the, if you apply voltages to the anode, right? The voltages that apply to the anode are, effectively controlling this width of the whole size as well. So as a result, you, your current not only depends on the voltage of the grid, but also depends on the voltage of the anode. Which is exactly like the early effect. For the basic modulation. Which translates to some sort of RO. Some sort of output resistance. Now, the, pro, the, the, the way they got around that, it was to shield a grid somehow from this by introducing a fourth plate or fourth terminal, another grid which was kept at a constant potential. Right? And you kept that at a constant potential, and it's called a cascaded cathode. It's called because it ca cascaded cathodes, right? So this is called a tetrode, because it has four terminals. So it was called a cascaded cathode, or for short. Sure, and then there was another problem with the secondary electron, because these electrons that hit you know, the anode, what happened is that they actually, uh, uh, because of the uh, thermionic uh, effects, so basically they ionize some electrons, so they create a secondary electron. So if they added a fifth grid, I mean, a third grid, the fifth terminal, that was kept at a different potential to absorb these you know, secondary electrons. And that, was, that resulted in a pentode, which was a very common back kind of vacuum tube. 
most of the typical backend user pin those. That was the one that had reasonably good performance. So they have five, they have five terminals. So it's like, it's like in, in effect, this base is like its fourth terminal. Right? So you keep this constant so you can isolate the variations here from the variations there. It's called cascode. Actually, many of these things are the ideas come from the vacuum tube days. A lot of these ideas, I mean, yeah, topologies even, right? The topologies, cascode, differential pair, all of those were invented in vacuum tube days. And even a lot of terminology, you can see there's a lot of remnants of those, uh, remnants of those times. So IS, the saturation current in bipolar transistor. There's no saturation per se related to that current. It comes from the vacuum tubes. The current very generation of electrons, you are limited by the number of electrons you have at your disposal. Generate. Yes? So could you tell me uh, why the second case of have the early effect? The, the second case of Yeah. So what happens is that basically, otherwise, if you change the potential of, of, in here, right? Yeah. It's like a collector, right? So that potential changed the potential in the whole space. It's a three-dimensional effect, right? So it changed the potential here, so it could change the size of these holes in the potential, equal potential surfaces, right? It could modulate them. And as a result, you could basically, that would affect the number of electrons that will pass, and hence the collector for the or cathode current. Now, when you put another one, it basically, the, those variations are absorbed, because it's kind of like a, and a cage for it, right? It's at a constant potential, so the variations here are between, happen between these two places and there. So it kind of shields this second, the, the, the original grid, from the variations here. And as a result, you get less variation inducing this. But this one doesn't matter because the electrons are already accelerating here, so they go through this potential. It, it is at a negative potential. What was the grid there? Well, they made all sorts of different materials. I mean, they used it. Different kind of metals, then they had some alloy tungsten, I think they use it sometimes because of that. And there are all sorts of variations. I mean, I, I, to be honest with you, some of them I don't even remember what they were. There were all sorts of alloys they devised to, for the grid. How do they make BS? How do they make BS? BS? No, no, they're not BS. It's a grid. It's really a piece of it's like a metallic mesh. It's like grading. They're not large, they don't have to be large. I mean, they, they're, they're, they're not very small. They can't be relatively large. And the thing is that they rarely made in a linear form like that. So what they had, they had a catheter in the middle, and then they had a cylindrical way. So they had these grids this, as a cylinder to maximize the um, area, coverage, the area. There are linear vacuum tubes too, but most of the typical vacuum tubes that you saw in old radios and all those things like the cylindrical ones, that's what they are. So they did flow of the current is radial from the center of the other. Okay. Um, so that's cascode. And so how about the input and output impedance of a cascode? Let's quickly do that. What is the input impedance? If I ask you the input impedance of a cascode. Let's look at my let's do it by intersection. Yeah, what is it? Or pi, right? If you forget, remember, the only thing you need to remember is that this is alpha or n in the emitter. Whatever is in the emitter, move it to the base, reflection will multiply by 1 plus beta. 1 plus beta times alpha is beta. Beta or n is r pi. Beta or n or r pi. Or by definition, is r pi. Now, so the input impedance is like that of the common emitter. So it's not that low. So for 1 milliamp of beta of 100, it's about 2.5 kilo ohm. So it's much better than that of the 25 ohm here. So that's a good thing, because I could increase, if I want to make a voltage amplifier, then my input impedance is not extremely low like that of the common base. Now how about my output impedance? My output impedance is extremely large if, if RC is not very small. I mean, if it's RC is small, it's just RC. But if RC is large, then it's large, so Depends on what I want to do. If I want to make a good current source, that's the way to make it. If I want to make a good voltage driver, it's not good because it's a voltage source that has a very large power. Well, it's a source that has a very large input impedance. Right? So what do I do if I want to use it as a voltage amplifier, for instance? I use one of those common emitters as a buffer to follow it. So I could, in principle, later on, put something like that here. And we'll talk about that stuff, so don't worry, you don't need to follow that. I'm sorry, 
common collection. Is that common collection? Is there a fault? Common collection. I must have, I may have misspoke. Um, okay? So, you see that now what we've done is the first thing. We basically combine a common emitter and a common base to make the stage. It has certain properties that are good. And it has an, an, an intrinsic gain, which is higher than that of the, higher than that of the common emitter. And what we'll do later, uh, next time, when we come back, we'll continue on this path and go and make this stage and try to increase how can we get the maximum possible gain out of a single stage. And then we'll talk about uh, MOS variations of this. So, so far we've been talking about bipolar, then we'll talk about MOS and see what, what are the similarities and differences. When you go to MOS, that's a name. We basically have the three basic topologies, the common source, common drain, and common gate. And then we'll talk about those. And I have another handout based on that, which we'll, we'll cover next time. I'll be welcome to take them. And uh, we'll cover it next time. And any questions? Any questions about the material today?